Welcome to the Wednesday seminar at uh, broadcasting from Weihai. So I'd like first to uh, celebrate and acknowledge the traditional owners and custodian of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respect to the elders, past and present, and embrace their continued connection to this place. I'd like to also to extend this respect to elders from other communities where people are joining us from today. So it is an absolute great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker today, Debnas Gosol, and is currently uh, is a senior lecturer uh, and NHMRC Emerging Leadership Fellow at uh, the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Melbourne Uni. So a bit of background, Debna received his PhD degree in Structural Biology from the MSc Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge and Darwin College where he worked with Dr. Jan uh, Lowe on bacterial cell division. And we have some, uh, realized that we have some connection there because we were working on the same set of protein at the time. So subse subsequently, he joined Dr. Grant Jensen's laboratory at Caltech uh, for his postdoctoral training. And at, at Caltech, he investigated the structure and function of bacterial secretion systems using uh, electron cryotomography. So he has since published uh, many high uh, profile papers in Nature Microbiology, NatureCom, in Life, and Bo and P PNAS. So Debna established his own laboratory last year in the middle of at the start of a pandemic, which was probably very difficult. And, and that's why it's a really a pleasure now to, to have him today, to be able to speak in front of the audience and meet many people at, at WeHi. Uh, so his group is working on the structural mo molecular biology of large bacterial protein complexes that are important for pathogenesis. So I leave up the floor to Devna. Thanks, Devna. Hello, everyone. So first of all, thanks to uh, Isa, Peter, uh, James, and Onisha for inviting me uh, for a seminar at WeHi. Uh, it feels really great that uh, you know I'm now giving a seminar in an auditorium in, in an in-person seminar, so it's really nice. Uh, it's almost like after a year and a half, so it's it's super exciting. Um, so my group works on uh, bacterial secretion systems, and uh, the major uh, area of interest for my group is um, bacterial and viral molecular machines that are important for pathogenesis. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, a one uh, such super family of molecular machines known as bacterial secretion systems. So uh, there are about 10 different types of bacterial secretion systems, and these are really large molecular machines. Uh, many times they extend all the way from inner membrane to the outer membrane through the periplasmic space. They are multi-component, multi-megadalton molecular machines, and uh, bacteria utilize these molecular machines to translocate a variety of uh, molecules, effectors, small molecules, peptide glycan fragments, and uh, other, like, for example, DNA protein complexes, and they cause uh, many disease conditions through these secretion systems. So today my talk would be mainly focusing on the bacterial type 4 secretion system. So the type 4 secretion system is, a, again, a very large uh, macromolecular complex, and uh, this molecular machine is important for many different disease conditions in humans, plants, and in animals. Uh, this particular molecular machine is found in gram-negative bacteria, they're found in gram-positive bacteria, and even in some archaea. Uh, in terms of function, the bacterial type 4 secretion system can be divided into uh, three different classes. The first one is the conjugation system. And um, as we know, that bacterial conjugation is a process through which bacteria can exchange genetic material, so one bacterial cell can transfer genetic material into another bacterial cell using these uh, type 4 secretion systems. And this is the primary mode of horizontal gene transfer in bacteria. The other type of type 4 secretion system is called the competence system. So using, again, this particular molecular machine, which is the type 4 secretion system, bacteria can intake DNA from environment or exude out DNA into the environment. And these are, again, great sources of bacterial fitness. Finally, the bacterial translocation system, which is utilized by a wide range of gram-negative and gram-positive 
pathogenic, pathogenic bacteria to cause a variety of disease conditions. For example, Helicobacter pylori utilizes the CAG type 4 secretion system to inject oncogenic protein CAG-A, and that causes gastric cancer. Then there are other pathogens, for example, Brucella, Bartonella, Bordetella, Legionella. There are many different pathogens that utilize type 4 secretion system to cause a variety of disease conditions. So two of the things I have highlighted here are the stomach cancer or the peptic ulcer and spread up antibiotic resistance. And both of these are primarily uh, you know, facilitated by the type 4 secretion system. So as I said, the stomach cancer is because of Helicobacter pylori that utilize the CAG type 4 secretion system to cause stomach cancer. And then um, the conjugation system is the process through which bacteria can exchange genetic material and fitness or do horizontal gene transfer. And that's one of the primary reasons for the spread of antibiotic resistance. So these molecular machines are really important and uh, very uh, relevant. So today I'll be talking about the Legionella type 4 secretion system, which is again a multi-component, multi-megadalton molecular machine that Legionella pneumophila utilize to cause Legionnaire's disease. So the Legionella type 4 secretion system almost acts like a molecular machine gun. It can inject 300 different types of effectors, 300 different effectors. And these effectors actually aid their entry into the eukaryotic cell, help them to form a niche, and then uh, that helps them also to grow uh, large in number inside a, a eukaryotic cell, and then uh, help their dissemination to other cells. The, these effectors interact with many different pathways. They interact with the uh, endocytotic pathway, autophagy pathway, uh, and you know, uh, many other pathways. And they interact with mitochondria, Golgi, endoplasmic reticulum, cytoskeletal elements. So basically, they interact with everything that you can imagine. And uh, they basically paralyze the host cell so that they can survive and grow in large in number and uh, you know, spread from there. The Legionella type 4 secretion system, as I mentioned earlier, it's a large molecular machine. It has 27 different components and an estimated molecular mass of about 12 to 15 megadalton, so which is about three to four times the size of ribosome. You can imagine how big this molecular machine is. And this is actually, it doesn't look very much like the conjugative or the prototype type 4 secretion systems, because those are made of 12 genes and molecular mass of about four megadalton. So the Legionella use a very elaborate type 4 secretion system. So far, the only thing we know that is that uh, these molecular machines form ring-like structures on the surface of the cells, Legionella cells. And these are osmotically shocked Legionella cells imaged by negative staining electron microscopy. And what we know is that they form these ring-like structures on the cell surface. And if you delete the type 4 secretion system, then those structures are missing. So that's the only thing we know about this molecular machine. And it's not only about the Legionella type 4 secretion system. Overall, about all other type 4 secretion system, our understanding is really poor. And the major reason is this. So um, when we are looking at biological systems, then um, we have two different spectrums, right? So basically, we, we are, sometimes we are investigating something which is related to cell biology. And we are investigating those using fluorescent light microscopy or super resolution microscopy. And we are looking things at a scale of, say, you know, 100 nanometer resolution. Or we can push it using super resolution to go to, say, 50 nanometer resolution. And similarly, when we are looking at in the structural biology domain, then we are looking at purified protein complexes using NMR, exocrystallography, and single particle cryo-EM. And there we are looking at purified proteins at near atomic resolution. But then there's clearly a gap in this particular region, and um, a lot of very exciting biology happens in this region. For example, large macromolecular machines, which are membrane embedded, it's very hard to purify them with all their components intact. And we cannot study them using uh, any of the classic uh, structural biology techniques or using other uh, light microscopy techniques. So as I said, the type 4 secretion system falls right in this domain. And it's really hard to sort of study these molecular machines using uh, classic structural biology or uh, super resolution or light microscopy technique. But then electron cryotomography comes to rescue here because it uniquely bridges this gap. And we can look at cells, we can look at macromolecular machines, proteins. We can really look at it in this particular uh, missing uh, region. So we decided that, OK, because you know, type 4 secretion systems are really large molecular machines with that many components, dynamic systems. So the only way to sort of try, you know, try to investigate these molecular machines is by electron cryotomography. 
previously people tried to purify uh, this molecular machine from cells or subcomplexes of that, but those attempts failed. And the primary reason is because they are like multi-component system. And they are tightly embedded with the bacterial cell and envelope. So what are the advantages of cryo-electron tomography? The advantage of cryo-electron tomography is that you can investigate a molecular machine in situ in its near native state with all its components. And we don't have to uh, attempt and purify these molecules um, uh, in these uh, this molecular machines using detergent. We don't need to do any staining. We don't need to do any dehydration. So the artifacts are very minimal, if uh, not at all. So uh, maybe you already have some background, but if someone is not familiar with the uh, tomography process, I'll give a quick overview of that. And basically, we grow cells in liquid culture. This is the EM grid that placed in a robot, which is called a vitrobot. It goes inside the vitrobot, and then uh, we take cells and then directly apply on the EM grid. No fixation, no uh, chemical treatment, nothing. It goes on this, uh, in between these two blotting papers, it gets blotted and rapidly flange frozen in uh, liquid ethane or liquid ethane propane mix. So as a result, what happens is bacterial cells are really rapidly flange frozen, and this process is called vitrification. By vitrification, what means is that the, I, the water molecules do not get the time to form crystals. So it's just stalling of water molecules. So once we have the EM grids, we can set up you know, the black dot you can see here. These are basically cells. And we can place this uh, EM grid inside an electron microscope. And uh, we can start collecting 2D projection images. In tomography, what we do is that we tilt the stage at multiple different angles from plus 60 to minus 60 and keep collecting all these 2D projection images. And this is called a tilt series, all this collection of images. Once we have collected all these images, then we can put them together computationally to generate a 3D volume, which is called a tomogram. So um, the method that we use for generating the tomogram is called a back projection method. And the principle of back projection method lies uh, in Fourier slice theorem. So what the Fourier slice theorem tells you is that if you have a 3D object and if you collect a 2D projection image of that and get a Fourier transform of that, then basically that will represent the central slice of a 3D Fourier transform of the original object. So we can keep collecting many such uh, you know, tilted images. And basically what we are doing, we are filling up the Fourier space. And in the end, we can do an inverse Fourier transform to get back the 3D uh, original object. There's some other concept, like for example, missing wedge concept. I won't go into details of that. So basically you will not get the exact 3D original object, but very close to that. So this is what is, again, showing the same thing. Um, so we did the same thing for uh, Legionella cells. We basically imaged that, them using uh, you know, the tilting scheme. And what I'm going to show you is the 3D volume of a Legionella cell. So we'll go from the very top slice, uh, top surface of a 3D volume uh, down the, you know, all the way to the uh, very bottom surface. So um, here, this is the outer membrane of the bacteria. This is inner membrane, and you will see that there are these electron-dense objects that are extending all the way from bacterial inner membrane to the outer membrane. So there are many, many of these uh, uh, electron-dense cone-shaped objects, and these are actually bacterial type 4 secretion systems. So how do we know that these are bacterial type 4 secretion systems? Because from our previously, uh, you know, all our immunofluorescence experiment, we have shown that if we do immunofluorescence for some of the components of the type 4 secretion system, which are called dot components, then they always localize at the bacterial cell poles. So this is DAPI staining, this is immunofluorescence, and you can see they're always localizing at the bacterial cell poles. And their polar localization is really important. The molecular machine always localizes at the cell poles, and that's very important for its pathogenicity and effective delivery. So this is a tomographic slice of a 3D, of a 3D tomogram. And you can already see these uh, molecular machines. And uh, in a type 4 secretion system deleted strain, uh, we don't see these uh, cone-shaped uh, structures. So those are gone. So that kind of confirms, again, that these are type 4 secretion systems. So if you look at individual particle level, then uh, this is bacterial outer membrane. This is inner membrane. We can clearly see some densities here associated with outer membranes, some in the periplasm, and some other additional densities, which you'll not be able to notice, I guess, because you are not looking at this every day, and I'm looking at it. So, But anyway, uh, we can already start seeing many uh, features from these individual particles. But then uh, at the individual particle level, the signal-to-noise ratio is not that great. So what we need to do is we need to collect many such tomograms and box out many such particles and um, average them to improve the signal-to-noise ratio. And 
this process is called a subtromogram average, and this is the subtromogram average of the dot ICM or the type 4 secretion system from Legionella. The local resolution is in the range of 2 to 4 nanometer resolution, and even at that resolution, we can already start seeing many distinct structural features. For example, we can see here these densities, which we call alpha and beta densities. There's some density in the periplasm, which we call gamma densities. There are some faint densities here, which are wing-like densities. The outer membrane and the uh, periplasmic complex gets connected to the inner membrane complex through the stock region, and there is these cytoplasmic ATPS densities. Now here, one thing to note is that uh, when you're looking at all these alpha, beta, and gamma densities, you can see there is a paired density here. So it just means that the alpha and beta, these densities are forming ring-like structures. We are just looking at 2D slice of a 3D structure. So this structure is basically a stack of multiple rings. And the outer membrane complex and the cytoplasmic complex, these are pretty flexible. So what you need to do is basically, uh, we need to average the outer membrane complex with a different mass compared to the inner membrane cytoplasmic complex, and this is a composite structure. Now, now that we have an overall view of how the molecular machine look like, um, but we don't really know which all densities are constituted by which all proteins. So these are like 27 different proteins that constitute this molecular machine, but which electron density is being formed by which of the molecular, uh, which of the proteins? This knowledge is based on fractionation studies. So we know that there are like a bunch of proteins that localize at the outer membrane. Some of them are in the periplasm, and some others are in the inner membrane or in the cytoplasm. But where exactly all these different proteins are localized? So to know that, um, or to basically know the molecular organization of this complex, we took a threefold approach. So the first one is we delete one or multiple proteins from this complex, and then look for missing densities. So basically, we have a wild-type complex where we delete one or two components, and do a subtomogram average, and then compare that with a wild type structure, and then see, look for missing densities, and attribute dens density to that particular protein. The second approach is to fuse a GFP or other protein to that, and then look for addi additional density. So if there is a protein, we fuse a GFP to that, and look for additional density in the subtomogram average. And finally, we reconstitute subcomplexes. For example, if there is a, a core complex made of five different proteins, we just reconstitute those five proteins and nothing else. Everything is in a deletion strain. And then look for those five proteins, how exactly they're forming that particular core complex. So while doing all these different mutant analysis, what we realize is that when we fuse a particular protein dot F to a superfolded GFP, that remarkably stabilizes this complex. So this is the wild type complex. This is the dot F superfolded GFP fuse complex. And you can already start seeing many different structural features. Now, there's no artifact involved, because this molecular machine is still functional. It can still secrete effectors, and the bacteria can survive inside eukaryotic cells. So that just suggests that this is a functional type 4 secretion system. It just got stabilized. So two of the striking features that we observe are this one. So basically, the gamma and the beta density. So these two densities are connected by this arm-like density. And then um, this stock density is not a solid object, but rather a uh, secretion channel. And uh, this is about a 14 nanometer long and 4 nanometer wide channel through which effectors would be first transported and then be deposited in this place, which we call a secretion chamber, which is about 32 nanometer wide. And then from there, they'll be secreted out. Now, while looking at all these different particles, individual particles, we saw many top views. So, for example, this is one top view, this is another, this is the third one. And we calculated the rotational cross correlation for all these different particles and found out that this molecular machine at the outer membrane part has 13-fold symmetry. And once we apply 13-fold symmetry, then many of the structural features resolve really nicely. So, so far I was showing you a 2D slice of a 3D structure, but now I'll show you a 3D schematic. Probably this will give you a better idea how this molecular machine looks like. So this is the outer membrane, this is peptidic glycan, this is the inner membrane. So, um, this part, actually, the outer membrane complex and the periplasmic complex together forms this really large secretion chamber. And then the, uh, I'm sorry. So yeah, so this part actually forms the secretion ch chamber, the top part, and then um, the red color uh, you're seeing, that basically forms the secretion channel. So the secretion channel connects the cytoplasmic complex to the secretion chamber, and the yellow color things are uh, ATPases, and this is a cross section of the complex. Now, going back to the previous question that I uh, you know, mentioned briefly, that how do we know which all densities are constituted by which all proteins? 
So there are 27 different proteins. How do we know which one is constituted by uh, which one and what is the molecular organization? So as I said, that we took this threefold approach, and using this threefold approach, we imaged many of these different mutants. So basically, individual protein mutants, uh, multiple protein uh, deletions, and I also reconstituted many of those. And then uh, wherever there is a complex still available, we create a subtomogram average for that. So interestingly, uh, there are these dot C, dot D, and dot H. There are three different proteins. Just individual deletion wipes out the whole 27 protein complex. So these are really important uh, components of the molecular machine. But then if we put them those three back, then you already can see a, that subcomplex returned back. So these are all in a deletion strain, just those three proteins expressed. It's like in situ reconstitution. And whenever we found these complexes present, we basically created a subtopical average for that. So for this, we had to image like about 20 different strains and then collected 3,500 uh, uh, tomograms. So that's actually you know, a large number of tomograms and did a lot of structural analysis. I will not have the time to really go into details of all this, but I'll quickly show you three different examples, how exactly all this information came together and helped us to build a molecular uh, you know, architectural model for this complex. So first one example I'm going to give you is dot K. So dot K is an outer membrane protein, and of course, from the schematic, it's very obvious that nobody <coughs> knew where exactly this is located within this complex. Uh, so what I did is I basically, uh, you know, imaged a dot K deletion strain, and this is a dot K deletion mutant, and this is a subtomogram average. Again, the process is same. You collect many tomograms of many cells, box out all the particles, create a subtomogram average, and uh, this is the dot K mutant. This is wild type structure, and this is the difference map between the wild type structure and the deletion mutant. And whenever you see yellow density, that means missing density. And clearly, you can already see from your eyes that, you know, this density is clearly missing mm -hmm. here. So that just means that dot K forms a ring right below the outer membrane. So there's no crystal structure available for dot K, but uh, you know, I tried to predict the structure of dot K using fire, ITSL, and quark, three structure prediction soft software, and all of those very strongly suggested that dot K would form uh, or you know, uh, fold just like uh, outer membrane protein from Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is called OPRF, which is a peptidoglycan binding protein. So it suggested that it will likely fold like that, which are very high confidence. And there is a crystal structure available for that, so I can take that and then I place that crystal structure in that place. And uh, uh, here you can already see that we can, you can see some densities here for the peptidic ligand um, here. So that's clearly interacting with uh, dot K, which is already known. So you know, we, whenever we try to place a protein structure in the density map, we always take into account all cell biology, genetic, structural, biochemical data available. So that all suggests that uh, this is the right location for dot K. So this, there'll be the peptidic ligand. So um, the next example I'll give you is a dot F. This is a very important structural component of this molecular machine, and it's an inner membrane protein which extends to the uh, periplasm. So we knew that dot F would be somewhere here. So again, very similar approach. Uh, deleted dot F and then created a subtomogram average of that. This is a dot F deletion mutant. But then this is a structural component, component of this molecular machine, so deletion of that really destabilizes this complex. And in the difference map, uh, in the difference map, uh, you can see that the yellow density is spread. So in this kind of situation, it's really hard to pinpoint where exactly this protein is localized. So um, in this kind of situation, we take the second approach, which is fusing uh, a GFP to dot F and look for additional density. So this is dot F uh, uh, you know, fused to a GFP. And um, you know, the red density here, the difference map shows additional density. And it clearly shows that uh, dot F, you know, the C terminal of dot F would be localized here. So from many other experiments with reconstitution and focused alignment with dot F deletion strain, we pinpointed that this density, the very faint density here, is because of dot F, and the C terminus would end up in this uh, here, so the GFP density is because of that. Again, there's no crystal structure available for uh, dot F, but uh, using three different software, we predicted the structure of dot F, which suggested that dot F, dot F would form a very long helical structure. And uh, I basically place one of those ITSR models here uh, for dot F. Uh, the density for dot F in the subtomogram average is pretty weak, and it could be because of its low occupancy or because it's not really, um, there's not much sort of electron density for these. As in, it's just a helix, so that's why probably you don't really see much in the average. Then finally, I'll give um, you know, one more example, which is the uh, example of dot G. Um, so this particular protein is the hop protein in this complex. 
And uh, this is the only protein that goes all the way from inner membrane to outer membrane and forms a dome-like structure. So this is like a massive protein. Um, so previously it was suggested that uh, in other type 4 secretion system, it could localize somewhere here. But again, as I said, that no complete structure is available for any uh, type 4 secretion system. So um, it, it was really not known where exactly it will localize and how it will f contribute to the structure. So uh, this is wild type complex. Again, uh, this is a delta dot gene deletion strain. And uh, this is the defense map. And it clearly says, it shows that you know, it goes all the way from inner membrane goes through this and then forms a dome-like structure at the outer membrane. And it fits really well with the uh, biochemical data that was previously um, you know, published. Now again, as there's only one structure available for the C-terminus of dot G, but there's nothing available for the N-terminus of dot G. I tried to predict the structure, and uh, it looked like uh, the N-terminus of dot G, which is this part, would fold uh, in the form of a beta helix, and it you know, the predictor structure actually fits pretty well with the curvature even and the length. So um, we basically place the predictor structure here and the D structure is uh, known here. Now, using a very similar approach, uh, uh, again, in, by imaging many different mutants, reconstituted strains, uh, I generated all these different 14 new structures for all these different mutants. Uh, I don't have the time to really go into details of all these, but, you know, uh, all this really helped to understand how this molecular machine is built and uh, to build an atomic, uh, build a uh, architecture model for this complex. So wherever there is a st structures available, I place that in the uh, subatomic average density map. But if there is a structure not available, in that case, I just uh, have to place, you know, uh, kind of an envelope for this structure. For example. Uh, this is for dot H. There is no structure available, and we cannot even predict this. So in that case, we basically just uh, you know place an envelope uh, for that. That this is how this small, this uh, protein would extend from the outer membrane to the periplasmic space. But again, this is not at atomic resolution. This is not at near atomic resolution. So um, of course, I cannot say how exactly different proteins are oriented uh, one against another and. Uh, how exactly what are the interfaces? But even at this resolution, we can learn a lot from this. So, um, for example, we can for the first time show that there is a secretion channel, and the secretion channel is made by this particular protein, dot G. Uh, it's uh, in terminus beta helix would form this secretion channel. And then um, we can also show that uh, there's this large secretion chamber, and we can pinpoint where exactly different proteins are located. And it's really satisfying that just few weeks before, there's a structure that, uh, you know, uh, Melanie Oyes Group from Michigan, they try to purify the core part of the complex. and. Uh, you know, wherever we have suggested all different proteins, they found exactly the same. So it's, it's really deeply satisfying. And also we were able to sort of, you know, uh, show which all subcomplexes are very stable. And because we can show all that, so people can really, you know, purify all these subcomplexes now and study them by cryom or by crystallography to look at uh, their interfaces and, you know, how they really uh, look like at near atomic resolution. Now the point is, uh, so far I was talking mainly in the region of you know two to four nanometer resolution. Can you push it beyond that? Can you get high resolution structures? One of the primary limitations is because I was looking at 20 different mutants, so I I cannot I, and I was already pushing the microscope time available to me because I was collecting many tomograms. Each tomogram takes about half an hour, and I was collecting 3,500 tomograms. So you can imagine how much microscope time I was using. So it is not possible to get high resolution structure for all these, but we thought that can we really get high resolution structure at least for the wild type structure and you know look at it at higher resolution and it is indeed possible if you really collect many more uh, till series and start collecting many more particles so for example this is the wild type structure and then once we stabilize this structure using this particular construct the dot f uh, superfolder gap then we already start getting better resolution and here um, we basically stabilize this further by uh, using a uh, mutant atps which uh, which locks one of the ATPs, cytoplasmic ATPs, through this complex. And um, that really helped us to get to 18 angstrom resolution. And I'm confident that we can even push it farther by adding more particles and even stabilizing it uh, uh, more. And the key things for this higher resolution is, of course, the number of particles. And you can see that you know, for one structure, then we need 800 tomograms. Uh, and you know, once you have more particles, then we can classify it better. And then we can do subtle refinement and you know, push it to a higher resolution. So this is still an ongoing project, and hopefully this will be a future talk when I'll be able to sort of discuss this at higher resolution. Um, 
So now the next question we ask is that these are really big molecular machines. So how would they localize at the cell poles? These are like you know, multi-megadalton machines. And how would they really ta target these uh, machines to the cell poles? So uh, as I said before, there are 27 different components. Um, so we wanted to know which are the key tar polar targeting factors. So these are different components of this molecular machine. Uh, these are actually the five core components of this molecular machine. So they localize at the cell poles in a wild type strain. In a deletion strain, of course, you don't see anything. Uh, these are all immunofluorescence data again. So if we just express individual protein in a complete null background, then they don't localize at the cell poles. So none of the core components can localize at the cell poles on their own. So then we did the same exercise for all 27 proteins, express them one by one in a complete deletion background, and then look for their localization at the cell poles. And it uh, looked like there are only two proteins that can localize at the cell poles on their own, and these are DOTU and ICMF. These two proteins, if you express them just on their own, they can just localize at the cell poles. So these are most likely the uh, polar localizing uh, factors. Um, so then we wanted to understand more about the chronology of the assembly of this complex. So how exactly, which proteins are going first and which are dependent on which other. So basically we wanted to understand the network of their assembly. So here what we did is um, we're looking for localization of one particular protein in the absence of a one other component. So what I mean is basically we're looking for localization of this particular protein dot H. And a wild type strain, of course, it localizes at the both cell poles. And then we are looking whether this protein would be able to localize in the absence of dot A, B, C, D, and all basically other proteins. And you can see that in some cases, for example, in these, the ones marked with red, the protein is not localizing at the cell pole. So that means it, is, it cannot uh, assemble at the, uh, localize at the cell pole in the absence of these particular proteins. And it's, again, you know, satisfying to see that ICMF and DOTU, in the absence of those, this protein cannot localize at the cell pole, so confirming the previous result. Now, we did that for all other proteins as well. Again, I'm not going into details of that, but this gave us a tremendous amount of information about how exactly all these different proteins are localized at the cell poles and how they interact with each other and what's their chronology of assembly. And um, to understand more or fine tune our results, we basically reconstituted many of these complexes and subcomplexes. And again, won't want, don't want to sort of go into details of the, all that and did biochemistry for all these to confirm which all proteins are localized at the cell pole, outer membrane, inner membrane, periplasm, cytoplasm, and a whole lot of biochemical experiments. But what I'll tell you is that, you know, from all this exercise, from fluorescence, immunofluorescence data, biochemistry, and from our tomography data, what we really learned about the assembly of this molecular machine. So it seems like uh, the assembly starts with these two proteins, which are the polar localizing factors, so that, which are ICMF, oops, so ICMF and DOTU, the blue two proteins, so they will uh, you know, go and localize first at the inner membrane, at the cell poles. And then they will recruit these two proteins, dot C and dot H. The dot C and dot H protein is complex, is then uh, attached to the outer membrane by this protein, which is called dot D. And once a dot CDH complex forms, then multiple copies of dot CDH starts forming on the outer membrane. And this is facilitated by the outer membrane because of the avidity effect. And then once the dot CDH, you know, 13 copies of dot CDH complexes uh, are formed on the outer membrane that forms the secretion chamber. Then this secretion chamber is then connected to the inner membrane by this uh, protein dot G forming a secretion channel. And then after that, you know, this uh, yellow color protein dot F assembles and the uh, pink uh, dot I and dot G assembles, those are basically ATPase receptors, so they will recruit the ATPases. Now, all this while, when I was imaging all these, uh, you know, uh, different mutants and the type four secretion system, uh, it was uh, the bacterial cells were grown on broth culture. But this is an intracellular pathogen, so this will only start firing effectors when it is inside eukaryotic cells, because that's when it needs to survive. So then it will start, uh, you know, firing all the effectors. We tried many different ways to, you know, trigger it uh, so that it can fire all the effectors, but it, it didn't work out. So then we thought that, okay, if we have to image the open state of this complex, then probably we have to image them inside eukaryotic cells or while they are interacting with you know, some, of the, uh, you know, some of their target host cells. So for that, uh, we decided to look into Helicobacter pylori. And the reason is this. Helicobacter pylori is not an intracellular pathogen. So it attaches to eukaryotic cells and then fires 
uh, CAG A oncogenic protein using its type 4 secretion system, but it is still staying at the periphery of the cell, so it's more amenable for cryotomographic studies. So that's why we thought that we'll image this and then um, look for the type 4 secretion system if we can get it at higher resolution and in its open state. So uh, for that, we, uh, you know, we co-cultured uh, eukaryotic cells with Helicobacter pylori cells and then uh, imaged at the interface of Helicobacter pylori with uh, gastric epithelial cells. It is amazing that whenever we grew uh, Helicobacter pylori <coughs> cells with eukaryotic cells, then it formed these really nice tubular structures with port lab, you know, openings. And these are associated with type 4 secretion systems because you can change their length and abundance by mutating type 4 secretion system components. So these are associated with bacterial type 4 secretion system. Um, and we got, uh, you know, a subtomogram average of the uh, Helicobacter pylori type 4 secretion system as well. But um, the number of particles were relatively less. So for this, we're just using 54 particles. But because it is interacting with eukaryotic cells, so it is much more stabilized. So you can already, with 54 particles, we can get kind of compar comparable structure what we got with, say, 500 particles from Legionella. Um, so two things we wanted to know is that one is that we wanted to get, a, get an open state of the complex. And another thing we wanted to also know is that what's the structure of the ATPS complex. So far, I was really not talking much about the ATPS complex and its structure. And the reason is because the ATPS complex, it has three different ATPSs, and it's very dynamic complex. And so far, you know, whenever we try to image, even the mutants wouldn't get really strong signal for the ATPS. So it was really hard to align. Only when we started getting really higher with the number of particles with a stabilized version, then only we have started seeing some better densities for the ATPS complex. But in this part, with even 54 particles, we can already start seeing decent density for the ATPS complex. Um, but it was hard to you know, know which all ATPSs are present in this complex. We tried to make mutations, like you know, image in the absence of one or two ATPSs, but it was really hard to interpret this data. And you know, we are currently you know, involved in a really large scale project where we are trying to figure out what the ATPS complex looked like. But in this particular study, uh, what we did is we did a simulation of you know, artificially generated tomograms, and from there we compared uh, you know, which all arrangement would look like uh, this kind of density. And there are some, of course, structural data available for all these different ATPSs, so we put together all of that to propose that it will be most likely a five uh, barrel-like structures would be assembling at the, you know, uh, at the cytoplasmic side of this complex, and that will power this molecular machine. But then again, there are uh, other data that's suggesting that you know, it forms even more complex, something like a hexamer of dimer, and uh, we are still involved in this study. We're trying to figure out how the ATPS complex uh, looks like. For the open state of the complex, we, as I said, we just could gather 54 particles, so if we can get maybe you know 1,000 plus particles, we'll be able to sort of classify, and then um, we'll be able to get maybe the open state of this complex. But in this particular structure, uh, you know, with 54 particles, we can't really do classification. So it's probably a mix of open and closed state. So uh, we couldn't really uh, do much. So um, to summarize, uh, for the type four secretion system project, uh, we revealed the first in situ structure of the uh, of any intact type four secretion system. We reveal the molecular organization of the Legionella type 4 secretion system and showed how exactly this molecular machine assembles. And uh, we also showed that uh, most likely it's a, you know, a five barrel energy producing machine, the ATPS complex. Now, um, I was involved in multiple other projects at Caltech. I do not have really time to go into details of any of those, but I just thought that I'll give you like a 10 second trailer for all of those, just in case any of you are you know, interested in this project, we can discuss uh, later about that. It will also kind of give you an overview of what would be my research program here, because I'll con be continuing some of this uh, uh, here. So, um, so I was involved in other secretion system as well. For example, I was also looking at bacterial type two secretion system. Again, this is a multi-megadelta and really large molecular machine, but in this particular case, we're fortunate because um, there are many, uh, so basically for all the components, the crystal structures are available. It's just that we didn't know how exactly this molecular machine would come together to form this uh, large uh, secretion system. So because all the st crystal structures were available, for some of those I had to model, but you know, because structural data was available, I can sort of put them all together to generate a pseudo atomic model for uh, this uh, molecular machine. I was also uh, in, you know, doing another project where I was looking at bacterial competition. So it, it's pretty amazing. You can see that uh, this is like a Xanthomonas citri bacteria. 
It's utilizing its TIE-4 secretion system to kill a colobacter cell. So it's a contact-dependent killing. As soon as it comes in contact with a colobacter cell, it will just secrete some effectors and pop the uh, colobacter goes off. So um, the idea was that basically, you know, find such events using correlative light and electron microscopy, and then um, do tomogram, you know, collect tomograms of those to look at molecular resolution, what exactly is happening there. And the insights are pretty amazing because uh, it's not only Xanthomonas is using type 4 secretion system here, but you can see some, uh, you know, globular structures on the surface of Colobacter, and these are assembled by Bechtel type 1 secretion system. So Colobacter is really trying to fight back against type 4 secretion system, but of course it can't. Uh, uh, you know, fight back because TIE-4 secretion system is the best secretion system. I work on that. But uh, anyway, so you can really learn a lot of things uh, from that. So I was also involved in bacterial conjugation system. I was trying to understand that from agrobacterium. You know agrobacterium is a plant pathogen. It's really important for genetic transgenic plants. It's a, a multi-billion dollar, um, you know, plant, uh, plant, transgenic plant industry based on agrobacterium TIE-4 secretion system. And the conjugation system was, you know, uh, discovered in 1946, but so far we don't know how bacterial conjugation works. It's, it's amazing that since 1946 we don't know how it works. It's a, such a fundamental process. So, um, so there in agrobacterium we can see that, you know, bacteria form these tube-like structures and most likely uh, DNA transfer happens through these because we can see some DNA-like densities. That, that we're writing a manuscript on that. Uh, but then again, uh, agrobacterium also assembles, uh, you know, from the type 4 secretion system this... Uh, long filament-like structures, which are called uh, tipili, and uh, trying to solve the uh, structure of these, uh, you know, tipili using uh, single particle cryogen. So another project I was also involved in, uh, bacterial cell division. So far, we always know that b cells divide symmetrically from both sides. This is the paper where we showed that uh, bacterial cells, at least the initial part of constriction, is not symmetric. It starts from one side, and then the other side uh, will catch up. Um, then I was also, you know, involved in another project with uh, Archeal uh, Cellular Organizing Center. So that this is basically a really amazing structure, pyramid-like structure, which is localized at the Archeal, you know, cells, and that really decides where exactly Archeal filaments or Archeal flagella would be localized. Um, and then uh, there are other projects. For example, I was working on uh, bacterial flagella motors and looking at their evolution and assembly. So. Um, one of the, so I'll, I'll be continuing maybe a couple of projects from my previous time, but then uh, one of the key things that I'm really excited about is um, I want to study host pathogen interaction using cryotomography. And uh, for that, uh, as I said, for the you know, helicobacter pylori and gastric epithelial cell interaction, uh, we'll be co-culturing eukaryotic cells with bacterial cells or even viral or you know, uh, parasites, and then um, do correlative light and electron microscopy to look at the stages of infection if it is thick cells, then we, of course, have to do a milling to get, uh, you know, thin lamella so that it's more amenable for tomography. And once we have got uh, this lamella, uh, and because we have already, you know, pointed out where exactly we want to image through this correlative light and electron microscopy, then um, we can do fluorescence-guided imaging by correlative light and electron microscopy and cryotomography and, uh, you know, image the site of infection at really high resolution and, of course, segment to understand what's going on there. So, so I'm really excited about this, and this is, you know, the kind of work that uh, I'll be uh, doing here. So, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank Grant Jensen, so because you know, all of that, this work was carried out in Grant's lab. He's an amazing mentor, and my collaborator Joseph Vogel, who works on the Legionella system, and this is the Jensen lab. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. So we're going. Thank you, Devna, for a great talk. So we're going to take questions from the floor and also from uh, Slido, and Onisha is coordinating this. All right, I hope everyone can hear me. Yep. All right, um, so I want to reiterate that. Thank you, Devna, for that excellent presentation. And also just thank you for choosing to come to Australia with all this expertise that you're bringing. I'm sure, um, you know, as a research community, we'd probably That's amazing here. <laughs> be asking you lots of questions. Um, so there are already questions coming up uh, from the slide, and I'm, I'm probably will start with one before I um, come back to the floor series. Um, so the first question is from Hamsa Putakala, Puta, let's start. Hamsa Putalakat, uh, he's based in Latrobe. Um, his question is, 
the deletion strain if the protein is crucial for the type 4 secretion and survival? Okay. Yeah, so a uh, good question. So as I said that we have like a threefold strategy, right? So um, in case uh, there is a deletion of one particular protein wipes out the whole complex. For example, we saw there are three proteins deletion of individual proteins wiped out the whole complex. So in that case, of course, the deletion mutant would not work. So in that case, what we need to do is we need to fuse a GFP to that protein and then look for additional densities. What we can also do is that um, in that particular case, there are three different proteins that forms a very stable subcomplex. So we could take dot C, dot D, and dot H, three different proteins, and then express them in a deletion strain. And um, basically, it's an in situ reconstitution and then look for densities and uh, from the previous experimental data and from all our tomography data, we try to interpret those subcomplex and then figure out which density is because of which protein. Um, I'll go over the floor. Um, Peter, you can be loud and then get another little bit of question. Following on from Hamza's questions, when you delete things that aren't essential, is that because there's redundancy or is there, is there just more efficiency without them? Yeah, good question. So th there's both. So in some cases, uh, uh, okay, the question, sorry. I need to repeat the question. You might want to repeat the question. Yeah, that's right. Um, so the question is, uh, when I'm deleting components, uh, is, is there any redundancy that other proteins would take care for that? Um, or what was that second? Or does it make them more efficient if they're there? They still work, but they're not as efficient. Okay, so uh, will that still work, uh, but maybe not as efficiently? That's what exactly happens. So if you delete one or more components, then uh, bacterial cells can, to some extent, so depending on which component we are deleting, if we delete one of the core components, then the cells cannot survive inside eukaryotic cells because the secretion mechanism is affected. In some cases, uh, you know, there is partial loss of uh, function, but the bacterial cell can still survive. And there are still, there are again redundancies because in the whole talk, I was telling you there are 27 components, but as I said that in the last, you know, few weeks back, uh, Melanie Oyes group, they purified part of the core complex of the secretion machine, and uh, they found three more components. So, so who knows? There'll be even more components, and probably it's even bigger molecular machine. So, and they found that there, are, you know, there are proteins which look like very similar to each other, and probably there is, there are backup systems in place. All right, so I'm going to take the next question from Slaro. Uh, it's from Jerry Adams. How applicable is tomography system to organelles um, of mammalian cells? Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay. So I don't need to repeat this. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, we can. So um, you know, if you remember one of the slides where I talked about the resolution gap, tomography really covers all the way from cells to molecular machines to proteins. And in some cases, now we can even push it to higher resolution. So for example, uh, you know, if you are a recent study showed that we can get structure of ribosomes in situ at about four angstrom resolution. So we can go all the way from four angstrom to you know, several nanometer resolution. Uh, so we can definitely look at you know, organelles and uh, yeah, bacteria, parasites, all that. Uh, all right, so next question from the floor, Matt. Yeah, just thinking about, um, I mean, that, there's so many beautiful pictures in there. Um, you gave uh, an interesting example in the type four system of uh, where you made a GFP fusion, um, but it also stabilized the complex. Right. And that, that puts another interesting wrinkle in the interpretation, because if you're stabilizing the complex and you see new densities, how do, how do you know you're looking at a GFP density at that resolution versus uh, you know, just stabilizing what was previously a mobile section of the complex? Uh, very good point. Yeah? Very good point. So the question is, when you are fusing a GFP to a particular protein and then stabilizing a complex, then how do we know that the density, additional density, is because of a uh, because of you know some part of the protein complex got stabilized, or it is because of GFP? Now um, the two answers to this: one is the GFP fusion and then looking for additional density. That's pretty well validated for in situ uh, subatomic averaging method for localizing different proteins. This is well validated. Um, there are now multiple papers in the literature. Uh, few of them from Grand Jensen's lab and few from other labs, uh, for example, uh, June Liu's lab at Yale, and it's a validated method. So when you're looking at uh, any additional density for GAP, then um, it, is, it is definitely possible that it happened because the part of the complex got stabilized. But then we use multiple other uh, you know, results from 
uh, from our tomography, uh, exp uh, whatever you know, we are doing from our tomography and biochemistry and cell biology. So from all the exercise, all these exercises, whatever we are learning, we in take all that into consideration as well before placing a protein in a particular density. So that all comes together, and that helps us to sort of you know point out that okay, this is an outer membrane protein that binds to peptidic glycan. We are seeing a density, additional density next to the peptidic glycan in that particular protein. So that all helps. But then again, there is a there is a finite possibility that we might make some mistake there. That's right. Um, all right, I'm going to take the next question from the Slado. Uh, it's from uh, Mihel. Great results, Dave. Now, what is currently the minimum protein size to apply the in situ tomography? Well, I mean, yeah. So this is like, a, of course, we are, when we are looking at big molecular machines, then we can use tomography. If you're looking at small 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 proteins, can we look at them using tomography? Yes. The answer is yes. But in that case, it should be forming some sort of like a crystal or lattice or array, like chemoreceptor arrays, for example. Those are like not that large proteins. Uh, the proteins that form S layer on bacterial surface, those are also not large proteins, but they're forming some sort of an array. If it is a cytoplasmic protein, for example, um, it will be just floating around, so we'd not be knowing which one to look for. Um, so one of the limitation in cryo and tomography is that we don't have a GFP equivalent. So we can't say in the cytoplasm, okay, that's the protein floating around, so that's my protein of interest, just by looking at cryotomograms, right? So, so in that case, um, only if something is, say, forming a filament-like structure, or maybe forming a long array, or associated with membrane. So we need to be able to find that protein, and that should, protein should not just float away. So those are the two criteria. Uh, all right, next question, Isa. Um, is in terms of stabilization, is there any uh, small molecule, can you use any small molecule to stabilize the, the whole complex, and then, then you can push the resolution? Um, so the question is, can you use small molecules to stabilize the complex and then uh, you know, push the resolution to higher, um, you know, uh, yeah, yeah the, absolutely. However way we can stabilize the complex, I think that would help in um, pushing the resolution. I mean, for any structure determination, using single particle cryom or using subtomogram averaging, all these methods are basically um, averaging methods. So anything that's floating, dynamic, flexible, uh, if we can stabilize that, that will improve the resolution. Uh, all right, so next question from Sl uh, Slado from Sabi. Uh, considering flexibility in the T4, uh, secretion system, do you think cellular cross-linking followed by tomography would help in better averaging? Um, yes, absolutely. If we can cross-link the molecular machines and then look at them using tomography, that would, um, that would work. But it, it depends on you know, how finely we can cross-link it. Because um, again, when we are cross-linking, say there are three different ATPases, and maybe the ATPases also switch, because it's the same molecular machine. You can't have all three ATPases forming large structure below that. So probably they are switching. So it, it really depends on where exa when exactly you are fixing that. And that will determine, so if you can stabilize the complex, maybe a ATP at hydrolysis deficient mutant, and that is still flexible, and we are doing a you know, cross-linking, then it might work. But if it is a dynamic system and things are coming and going off, then um, it, it is still challenging. Uh, and one of the limitations is that we cannot have like 100,000 particles just like in single particles so that we can class, do classification and take 70% particles out and then still get a good structure. We are limited by a few hundred particles at, as of now. If it is a, you know, ribosomes inside you get, um, bacterial cells, then of course we can have a you know, few thousands. If flux pumps are overexpressed, you can get 10,000. But for molecular machines like this where we don't have any control, um, we get four or five particles per cell pole. It's really challenging. So uh, I guess we can try cross-linking, but I, you know, we really have to sort of see how that works. I cannot say that that will immediately improve the resolution. All right, next question from Floor. Uh, Thank you. Great talk, Matt. Thanks. So I have my question. You mentioned that a complex assemble at the um, bacterial membrane. <laughs> so did you observe some semi assembled complexes as well? Um, OK, the question is that uh, bacterial cells are assembling these molecular machines at their cell poles, so do we see any semi-assembled uh, molecular machines? Um, okay, so in other secretion systems, there was a parallel study done by June Liu's lab. They were looking at uh, E. coli type 4 secretion system, and then they found that, yeah, there are like, you know, semi-assembled secretion systems. Um, and they were able to sort of overexpress some of part of that, and then they could sort of classify and then look for semi-assembled secretion systems. For our case, um, because we are, when we are looking at individual particles, the signal-to-noise ratio is so bad that 
we can't really you know, look for semi-assembled secretion system. It's hard to say if some part is missing. Uh, but yes, I mean, as I said, that in E. coli system where people could overexpress uh, type 4 secretion system, that's the conjugative type 4 secretion system with 12 components, they could see semi-assembled secretion machines. Yeah. All right, so the next question is from Mike Lawrence. Great talk. How does 13 foil symmetry of the T4 secretion system maps onto, 40, on, onto four ATPases is, as the combination must be asymmetric? Is there functional significance in this? Yeah, it's an amazing question. Because this is now becoming a common theme that the symmetry of molecular machines is not the same across the world scale, across the world length. So, um, we already know that the symmetry of the outer membrane complex is different from the lower part of the periplasmic complex, which is different from the symmetry of the ATPS complex. ATPS complex is not 13-fold symmetric. Um, it's, even, it's even amazing that the Legionella type 4 secretion system outer membrane complex is 13-fold symmetric. The Helicobacter pylori type 4 secretion system is 14-fold symmetric. So the same molecular machine, they do not maintain the same symmetry. But again, I have to give a warning is that symmetry can also change on, like in the molecular machine in the same bacteria as well. Because in the flagellar motor, people have shown that same bacteria, same flagellar molecular machine, but the symmetry is different in different uh, you know, complexes. And uh, the outer membrane complex and um, ATPS complex, there is a different symmetry, and there is a symmetry break somewhere. So which could be at the junction of you know, the periplasmic complex and the cytoplasmic complex. How exactly those things are monitored, I think that will be a really exciting question to answer. We don't know that answer. All right, so we have only one minute left. I'm going to take the question from Slido. Sorry, Jason, you might have to ask afterwards. Um, so it's from Pradeep. How long or how much work does it take to generate those average tomograms? What type of technical expertise is involved? OK. Yeah, so, um, so I think it is like uh, you can imagine like you know, 15 years back how single particle was its tomography is now it's in a similar state. Because I remember when I started my PhD um, at LMB, uh, MRC laboratory of molecular biology, then people would pick their particles uh, from micrographs manually. And now we have like multiple different software. All the software would be able to just pick particles within minutes, right? And you can also do template matching, and it, it just works beautifully. In tomography, when we are looking at tomograms of individual bacterial cells, and as I said, that I, was, you know, I collected 3,500 tomograms for just this project. And in all each of these tomograms, I need to go to you know, each cellular volume and manually go through from the very top to the bottom surface and then pick all these particles from the noisy environment. And uh, once I look all these particles, then basically I need to sort of say, okay, there is the particle and then record the coordinates manually and then, um, you know, pick box out those particles and get a subtomum average. All this to say that we, at this point, we don't have any particle picker in tomography. If it is ribosome, well, you know, template matching would work uh, in bacterial cells. But if it is secretion systems or membrane embedded uh, molecular machines, it's like 99% it will not work. So in that case, we have to do manual man particle picking. And again, uh, there's another thing to this, is when we are looking at all these particles, and if we just put them to a program and say, OK, go on average, it will come back with some like, you know, really rubbish. Because, because there's so much flexibility, and uh, the, the outer membrane and the inner membrane, the distance also varies quite a lot. In some cases, it could be about 35 nanometer. In other cases, it could be 30 nanometer. So the particle length is also changing quite a bit. And we are limited by, you know, we cannot do classification with limited particles. So what I was doing mostly is that I was picking particles and even orienting them. So I did a sort of guided averaging approach. So it means like I was recording the Euler angle. So I was bringing it close to some sort of orientation across the particle y-axis. And then fitting the program that, okay, this is the you know, Euler angles, and then you need to search around this. You don't need to go too far, and you still get it. And that worked. So a lot of you know, manual um, you know, uh, thing is involved in this process. All right, so it's time now. We've already gone overboard. Um, so thanks, Devnath, again for being here and doing this talk. And I'm sure people can contact him if you have more questions. Well, thanks so much. Um, and yeah, thanks on behalf of everyone. And thanks, everyone who's joining online as well. Thanks and a lot. Thank you. Thank you.